Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. I'm live. I actually got it to work. I'm so excited. <laughs> and it's only two minutes after the hour. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. This is my very first live stream on YouTube. I understand that I have an excellent connection, so I'm just delighted to be here. And let me say this, I had this wonderful program to talk about today, and it's based on a recommendation from Leah Glass, who wrote and said that she's really enjoyed the In Presence series of broadcasts in which I talk about my personal life and my family. And she said, but you've never talked about your father, and could we learn a little bit more about your father? So I thought that I would talk about my father today. And the strange thing is that uh, just last night, I put together a whole series of video of, of images, of photos to talk about my father and the influence that he's had on me in my life. So I plan to do that uh, along the way, talking about my career in parapsychology as well and the relationship between my family background and my work in parapsychology. And before I begin, I also want to acknowledge Barbara Burton because she is the volunteer who insisted that we do live streaming. And as a result of her insistence, here we are now. And I uh, can see from the stream that there's a lot of activity uh, going on, a lot of chats. I'm, I'm delighted. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Uh, I can't really uh, stop to read all of the chats, but there are several of our volunteers and uh, Emmy and Laura and Jim are all monitoring the chat session and uh, responding to chats. And I'm hopeful that as we get going, uh, they're going to call to my attention important comments. So, uh, I hope I hope it all works out well. Uh, the mechanics of all of this are still a little elusive to me, but what I'm showing you is an image, if it appears, of my parents. There they are. I can see it now. It's shown up. These are my parents, and this is the date of their wedding, December 1942. My dad was a warrant officer in the army. He had, he had been a musician. He had his own swing band in college. And in, in fact, they were pretty good. High low and his high lows. My father's name was Hyman Mishlove. And uh, they traveled all around uh, the country, as a matter of fact. But then he got uh, drafted into the army. He went to officer school. He's a warrant officer at the time of their wedding. He had basically put his music aside and uh, married my mother after uh, getting to know her for six weeks in New Jersey, where they, uh, where she lived. And uh, to my understanding, they're on the phone right now. He's calling his parents back in Wisconsin to tell them he got married because he didn't think they could afford to travel in 1942 during the war from Wisconsin to New Jersey to be at the wedding. And my dad told me that's one of the biggest regrets of his whole life is that he didn't invite his parents to the wedding. But uh, my mom, incidentally, was an aspiring actress. I think she could have had a career on Broadway, but uh, she gave all of that up to uh, for the sake of the family and <laughs> ended up having a career in community theater in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I believe I'm back with you again. So, my parents were married in 1942. My mother came from a very intellectual family on the East Coast. Uh, they 
they were the kind of family that would sit down at the dinner table every night and argue about politics. And in general, they were very liberal. And there were a lot of, uh, intellectuals and writers in the family. I had an uncle who had uh, actually achieved some modest fame as, as a writer. He was unfortunately killed in an airplane crash in 1954. And then his wife, my Aunt Mickey, committed suicide. But I can tell you this, their son, who was five years old, when his father was killed and just entered college when his mother committed suicide, uh, Zachary, Zachary Rogo is, is a poet and a writer and a playwright. And I intend to uh, bring him onto the New Thinking Aloud channel to talk about the importance of, of poetry. Now, my father's family, however, were very different. They were from Wisconsin. They were very conservative. The one thing both my parents had in common, of course, is that their parents were immigrants. All of my grandparents immigrated to the United States uh, from Russia, basically. And uh, so they both grew up in households where Yiddish was spoken. Uh, they learned Yiddish as sort of a second language. They, they didn't speak it themselves, but the parents spoke it and they could understand Yiddish. Uh, the difference was that my East Coast liberal, uh, intellectual relatives on my mother's side of the family <laughs> rejected religion completely. Now, my parents were married by a rabbi, the same rabbi who had married my grandparents on the East Coast, but that was it. My grandfather, Abe, on the East Coast, uh, wanted nothing to do with rabbis. On the other hand, my conservative grandparents in Wisconsin were very devout. In fact, my grandmother my father's mother, who died when I was five years old, was so devout that uh, when my father was 13, this would have been 1930 because my father was born in 1917. He's studying for his bar mitzvah and they brought somebody to live in the household to train my father for his bar mitzvah because they grew up in the tiny little town of Berlin, Wisconsin. A very, very rural area. I think this town of Berlin had a population of about 3,000 people, and, and there were hardly any Jewish people there at all. So they had to bring in someone, I think, from Milwaukee or Sheboygan, a larger town, to train my father for his bar mitzvah. But my grandmother was so devout that she caught this fellow shaving on the Shabbos, on the Sabbath, on Saturday, and fired him because he was breaking the Sabbath. Now, that's the story. Of course, this was 1930 in the height of the Depression. And I suspect that the family indeed was, was very poor and maybe couldn't afford to maintain the uh, tutor in, in the household at that time. But in a sense, I've inherited both, <laughs> you know, an East Coast liberal mother and, and a conservative father from Wisconsin. Now, my father rejected religion as soon as he could get out of the household. He got to college, he had his swing band, uh, and then he uh, was enlisted in the army. And as I say, he married my mother. One thing I want to say is that I learned a deep lesson from my father. I learned it after his death. I think he communicated to me after his death. And uh, when I get to the end of this narration, I'm going to talk about what that was like for me. Uh, There's probably the most important lesson I ever learned from my father. So if you can stick with me through this narration, I'll get to that at the end. Growing up in Wisconsin, uh, it was very conventional. My father ran a furniture store. He had been a musician, but he gave up his trumpet. He played the, the trumpet in his swing band, and he gave that up for 30 years. He never played. 
the trumpet. He focused on raising a family, and he, he had a store that was open evenings and weekends. So, I hardly saw him growing up. I knew that he was working day and night and weekends to support his family, running, as I say, a furniture store. And in a way, we were kind of famous at the time because uh, for if any of you are viewers who grew up in the Fox River Valley of Wisconsin in the 1950s, my dad advertised all the time on Channel 2 of Green Bay as the furniture king of the Fox River Valley. So at school, kids would tease me and, and call me the furniture prince. And I grew up expecting that I would go into the furniture business, probably take over my father's furniture store. It was a very conventional background. My mother, on the other hand, uh, had always aspired to be an actress, uh, had quite a lot of talent, and began to star in many of the local community theater uh, productions in Wisconsin. And uh, for example, she played Blanche in the performance of the Tennessee Williams play Streetcar Named Desire. Now, Blanche is a very tragic dramatic character, if you're familiar with Streetcar. It's one of the great American plays ever written. And I got to see, in a way, uh, you could call it mediumistic ability because the character of Blanche came to possess my mother in some ways. After she did that performance, I don't think she was ever quite the same. It was as if Blanche Dubois, this tragic woman who, who gets raped at the end of the play, uh, was always there. And, and my mother, I remember the line, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. Now, my father uh, was a very conservative, conventional person. And uh, he used to complain. <laughs> he would tell my mother, I married a housewife. I married a mother of my children. I didn't marry you to be an actress. And and so they had this conflict going on. Now, I was pretty oblivious to at the time. I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And my mother finally figured out how to deal with my father. She got the uh, director of one of the plays that she was in to invite my father to try out for a role. And he tried out, he got cast. And so pretty soon both of them were performing. And my father occasionally got some big roles in the local community theater productions as, as well. In fact, my sisters, uh, my, I have two sisters, Pamela and Linda. Linda became a doctor. Pamela is, uh, became an artist. Uh, they also appeared in these productions. So, uh, my mother used to really pride herself on the fact that she overcame this conflict in the family by getting my dad involved in the theater as well. Another important part of uh, growing up, because we grew up in Wisconsin, away from my mother's liberal family in New Jersey, uh, but I had a cousin. I have uh, the Cohen family. Uh, my father's sister, his older sister, my Aunt Jeanette, married Aaron Cohen. And they uh, kept up the very strict Orthodox Jewish tradition of her mother and Aaron Cohen uh, as, as well. So they grew up as Orthodox Jews. But I became in high school very close with my first cousin, Stuart Cohn, and, and his younger brother, Bernie Cohn. We're still quite close. <laughs> Bernie lives in Wisconsin. He's maintained an Orthodox Jewish family the entire time. Uh, Stuart sort of rebelled against that. And uh, when Bernie actually went off to study in a Jewish high school, but Stuart went to the uh, public high school in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin with me, he was an amateur magician. So, growing up 
in high school, Stuart has learned hypnosis and he hypnotized me as a high school student and taught me self-hypnosis. I learned that in high school and I was very happy to be able to practice self-hypnosis and to, to be able to use it. In fact, I found that I could use it to study for tests. And I remember I took, uh, as high school students still do today, the PSAT, the Preliminary Scholastic Aptitude Test. Then the next year, you take the SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, which uh, is very important for your college uh, entry. And I hypnotized myself before the SATs and my scores, the PSAT is supposed to predict your SAT score, but my SAT score jumped up way, way like two standard deviations above the predicted score for my SAT, for my, for the, that the PSAT would have predicted. I got very high scores on my SAT tests as a result of self-hypnosis, which, uh, is something I've worked with since then my entire life. And the funny thing back in those days when my father understood what I was doing, working with self-hypnosis, he wanted to forbid me to practice self-hypnosis. He said, I don't want you to rely on anything outside of yourself. And that's good advice, except self-hypnosis is not it's not like spirit possession or something. I wasn't asking the spirit of Einstein to come into me. I was just drawing on my own unconscious reserves. My father didn't understand that. Now, I know for sure, growing up in Wisconsin, I never doubted that my parents loved me. But at the same time, uh, as I mentioned, my father in particular had very conservative habits. Uh, and I think I gravitated more towards my mother's side of, of the family. Uh, the more liberal, the more intellectual, the more exploratory side of the family. And then I went to college at the University of Wisconsin, uh, but I entered college in 1965. And you have to appreciate, for those of you who weren't alive then, the 1960s was a time of, if you think we're dealing with political polarization today, if you think we're dealing with social unrest today, the 1960s was even more so. Because college students were massively protesting the war in Vietnam. And all of a sudden, I came to appreciate that the many of the values that I had been taught growing up in a conservative Wisconsin family and, and school system were being challenged when I got to the university. And on top of that, uh, Timothy Leary was out there promoting LSD. And College students were beginning to use marijuana, so it was as if this whole crust of social conditioning from the 1950s, where the, in, in that post-war era, we grew up watching Howdy Doody and Roy Rogers and, and television kids were watching television, uh, the first generation of television children. Uh, life became kind of like a Norman Rockwell painting. It was as if there was this Americana and it was perfect and America was on top of the world. But then in the 60s, that, because of the protest against Vietnam, because uh, of the widespread use of psychedelic drugs and marijuana, the crust got blown off and we were confronted as a generation with a sense that there are depths within ourselves and within our culture that we haven't yet begun to explore. Now, I can say that I have made my life's work, looking back now over 50 years, my life's work was to explore those depths. But as I look back on the rest of my generation, I see that there were many, many missteps. 
People abused drugs. People got involved in all sorts of uh, cultish activities and social explorations that didn't turn out so well. Uh, I feel very fortunate. In fact, I have to say, looking back on my life, there must have been invisible guides. I can't say that I, like um, Norm Shealy, I'm going to release the interview with him soon. I just did it a few days ago, talking about the angels in his life with whom he has communicated and had detailed conversations. We're going to be talking about that interview, but I feel that there have been angels and they've been guiding me and helping me avoid some of the worst uh, errors I might have made, or even the errors I did make, uh, help preventing me from getting into deep trouble. But the, the angels never spoke to me directly, <laughs> Not the way they did with Norm Shealy. By the time I was a senior in college, I engaged in a senior honors thesis on the psychology of religious mysticism. I, I was pushed to explore it because of uh, mystical experiences, frankly, I was having as a result of taking LSD. But at the same token, I was, uh, frankly, a conventional materialist at the time. I had pretty much rejected the uh, Jewish religion I had, uh, you know, I, I was just sort of going along with uh, the crowd and the, and the crowd was basically, I have to say, materialistic and somewhat selfish. And I thought that uh, people who report mystical experiences or claim they see ghosts, uh, it was some form of psychopathology. And I would write up my senior honors thesis about this pathology. And yet, as I began exploring it as a senior in college, I got into the literature. I began reading William James and Abraham Maslow and uh, the other writers on mysticism. And uh, before long, I understood that there was a significant body of literature suggesting that these experiences were not so much signs of psychopathology, but they were intimations of a higher consciousness. Abraham Maslow, in particular, interviewed people like like Albert Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt and Helen Keller, some of the most accomplished people of his generation, and they reported having had mystical experiences that were, as they put it, key to understanding their evolution and, and, and their whole career. And Maslow began calling these peak experiences and, and suggesting that uh, – the most successful people base their life and their life work on these key experiences. So, I graduated from college uh, as an undergraduate in Wisconsin with, with that idea, got a quick job working for six weeks at a mental health center in Rockford, Illinois, where they practiced behavioral medicine and prided themselves on being 10 years ahead of the times. And after six weeks, I quit. I, honestly, I was, I was disgusted with, with what they were doing. It just seemed to me so out of touch with, with the depths of the human psyche that fascinated me so much. Behavioral therapy uh, just wasn't uh, – I, I couldn't relate to it at all. We had to fill out a little computer card every time we interacted with patients. But I do remember one incident when I worked there at the Singer Zone Center in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, they put me in the, in the most difficult ward. The people who were deeply psychotic, some of them hadn't even talked in years. They were practically catatonic. And in one case, I decided I had a book from the Esalen Institute written by Bernie Gunther called uh, about sensory awakening. And, and I did this little exercise where I have people tapping on their heads like this just to become aware of the sensations. Now I know there's a lot of uh, tapping. It's become a, a, a big 
movement in uh, psychology. Well, one woman who hadn't spoken in years began talking after that. And uh, so that was exciting. But I quit after six weeks, got in my car, and drove to California where I didn't know a soul and um, met people in California. I, I became a California hippie really quickly. I moved in with Peter and Marcy Hartman, wonderful people. And I learned organic cooking and astrology. And uh, Peter loved to play the Chinese game of Go. And we played Go every night, talking about astrology, smoking marijuana. And I enrolled in Berkeley as a, a graduate student in the School of Criminology. I thought I'd pursue my interests in clinical psychology that way. And honestly, the reason I did it is because I, I wanted a clinical psychology career. Berkeley was one of the best schools in the country. They did have a clinical psychology program and they had 800 applicants for 20 positions. And uh, even though I had excellent grades, I didn't think I could compete quite at that level. On the other hand, the School of Criminology also had a clinical psychology program with a criminological focus, and uh, I was uh, able to get in there. So I did. I was doing group therapy at San Quentin Prison with murderers and rapists. Now, I've told the story of the amazing dream I had at that time, and there are many, many adventures to talk about in the 1970s in, in Berkeley. But uh, one episode that I haven't talked about before, which was crucial in my life, was, was this. I began my interest in criminology thinking about solitary confinement and what it meant for a person to be in solitary confinement all alone. And I began doing things like uh, I spent three days inside of a closet once just to get a feeling for what that was like. And on another occasion, I went up to Mount Shasta, this 14,000 foot mountain peak in California and alone. And I climbed it. I climbed it to the summit. That would have been back in the summer of 1971. I spent a week alone on Mount Shasta. It's considered a sacred mountain by uh, many people, not just the Native Americans. There are uh, any number of mystical cults that uh, focus on strange happenings on Mount Shasta. And I think that week alone on that magnificent mountain had a deep impact on me, not in any specific thing that I could put my finger on. It's not as if, uh, you know, the mountain opened up and I entered a cave where I met mystical teachers and the hidden beings who live inside of the mountain. Nothing like that, although there are books that, that describe that, but it touched my life in a deep way. And I think it reflected upon the kind of person that uh, I was going to become as I grew up. You know, they say the child is the father of the man, and I'm a man now, for sure. I'm 73 years old. But as I look back on the experiences, uh, particularly in my early 20s, I created a direction for my life at that time that has been with me subsequently. Now, I want to pause for just uh, a moment, and I'm, when I come back, I'm going to tell you the story that uh, I had promised about the lesson I learned from my father. Now, I did say that I had grown away from the Jewish religion. Uh, I had a very extensive training in the conservative community I grew up in in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I studied for several years for my bar mitzvah, and um, the bar mitzvah itself is one in which I conducted both the Friday evening service and in its entirety, as well as large portions of the Saturday morning service, in addition to the recital of the Mafter and Haftorah, the Jewish prayers that are typically recited at the time of the bar mitzvah. 
But then I grew away from it. Uh, by the time I graduated from high school, my attitude was that uh, I saw all the rules and regulations of Orthodox Judaism as superficial and something I didn't want to be constrained by. And by the time I got to college, I, I think I was probably pretty cynical about it. But then, in the 1980s, uh, I visited Israel for the first time with my wife, Janelle. I got married, incidentally, in 1978, uh, while I was still a college student at Berkeley. And I'm still married to Janelle. We'll have our 42nd wedding anniversary. Uh, I might also mention that my parents were married for 55 years when my father died. So I, I'm very happily married. And I, in fact, I regard my wedding date in August of 1978, August 27th, is probably the happiest day of my life. But at one point, when Janelle and I were in Israel, something changed inside of me. And I felt I could no longer just ignore my Jewish heritage. Uh, because I hadn't, for example, been to the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur services, the high holy holidays of the Jewish religion, for well over a decade. And when the high holy holidays came along, after I had been to Israel, I felt this need to get involved in the local synagogue where we lived in San Rafael, California. And I became very active in the synagogue for a couple of years very active. I was in there praying and reciting, and I, I would sing these Jewish prayers. They're so moving, and I'd be in tears. <laughs> I would come early. And this is, was a Reform synagogue, which is the most liberal branch of Judaism, but I would show up early in the morning and put on what are known as tefillin, which is an Orthodox Jewish practice with, with some of the other more devout Jews in the synagogue. And uh, now, to be accurate, this was in the 1990s. My father died in 1997, and he was buried in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the same cemetery where his parents and his grandparents were buried. And I went back, of course, for the funeral. And I, afterwards, on my way back on the airplane, flying back to California, I was thinking to myself, now that my father has died, it's the appropriate thing for a, a Jewish person active in the Jewish community to have regular minions. That These are small gatherings. You need at least 10 Jewish men to, to prayer, to what's called sitting shiva, to say prayers in the commemoration of your departed parent. I was getting geared up in my mind. Yes, now I will do this. I will have daily prayers uh, now that my father has died. I'll get there in the synagogue early in the morning. We'll get 10 men together and we'll all pray together now that my father has died. And as I'm sitting on the airplane flying over the Rocky Mountains, I could hear my father talking to me I, you know, I haven't heard angels, but this was almost as if he was there speaking with me. Of course, it wasn't. It wasn't auditory, but it was clear. It was distinct. It was probably one of the most important messages I ever got from my father. He said, son, if you want to do that, do it for yourself. Don't do it for me. I don't need it. And at that moment, I realized that I also had completed a very important teshuva, a return to Judaism. I needed to return to it. It wasn't right just to abandon the religion because I went along with the materialistic crowd of 1960s college students. I had returned. I had come to appreciate uh, many of the depths of the religion. At the same time, I realized that 
some of the reasons I had for rejecting the religion were still valid for me as they had been for my father in his life. It's very funny, you know, the Ten Commandments says, honor your father and your mother. And honoring my father meant turning away from the same religion that he had turned away from. Even though <laughs> my Orthodox cousins would say, no, honoring your father and mother means becoming more religious. But I think that was one of the most important lessons that my father taught me was after returning to the religion, I could leave it once again and leave it in good conscience, knowing that like so many young Jews of my generation, I think they fled from the Jewish religion because of the horrible pain that had been inflicted by the Holocaust. And I had to come to terms with that, and I think I have. But now, you know, it's ironic because I consider myself in some ways like my friend Daryl Robert Schoon, who belongs to, who's a minister at the Temple of Universality. I consider myself, you might say, a universalist when it comes to spirituality. But I also think that is the authentic faith of the uh, Jewish ancestry that I have. Now, I've been talking for over half an hour, and I uh, gather that the um, chat is still very active. I, you know, I don't know if it's up on my screen, the live streaming chat. Yes. Oh my gosh, look at it. And um, there's so many uh, comments that are coming through, and there are three or four moderators. Uh, we have a great group of volunteers. Here's one. Uh, somebody asks, if you had one quote you could share with the world, what would it be? <laughs> yes, if I had one quote to share with the world, it would be this. We are all one. I am you and you are me and we are all together. That's it. I mean, it seems odd. It seems like we're separate people. We think of ourselves as separate people. We are so seduced by the illusion that we are actually separate when the truth of the matter is, the deep truth is that we are one. That's who we are in our consciousness. If we reach deep into the source of our own being, we are one. And I have to say this, I've been doing radio and television since 1972. And the best programs I do always end on that note. If there's one message that I want to hammer home. So when you talk about left wing, right wing, or human and alien, or, um, you know, Jews and Muslims, or communists and fascists, I have to say, bottom line, we are all one including male and female, <laughs> including animals, including octopuses in humans or cuttlefish or, you know, some of the strangest creatures that exist on the planet, insects. We are honestly all one. That If I have one message to share uh, over and over and over and over again, that's it. And I think ultimately, uh, an understanding of parapsychological phenomena points in that direction. It's, it's really the only way to come to grips with it. How can somebody, a remote viewer, know what's happening tomorrow or know what's happening a thousand miles away? There's no mechanism for that. There's no signal that gets transmitted. It's because of the underlying oneness of everything. The separateness is the illusion. It's a very seductive illusion. And of course, I, I fall into it many times every day. Okay, let me look at some of the other comments. Uh, what advice would I give to young men today regarding their role in society? 
you know, everybody is so different. I don't know that young men uh, is a good category uh, to think about. Uh, but I do remember once when I asked a very similar question and I was interviewing Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist. And I asked him that question, what advice would you give to young people? And he said, follow your passion. I have to agree with him. He followed his passion. And I can say, thank God I followed my passion. And if people can do that, if you can follow your passion, I think it's hard to say. You may have all kinds of trials and tribulations, as I have had, and as everybody ends up having. At the end of the day, you can say it was worth it. Okay. What does the colorful yin-yang mean? That image came to me. I actually have patent and copyrighted. I have copyrights on 800 variations of the rainbow yin yang. I was walking uh, down, um, what would street would it have been? Uh, Lake Street. I was walking down Lake Street in San Francisco one day when the image came to me and I began drawing it and hired an artist to create an airbrush version and eventually created the um, digital versions of the rainbow yin yang. Uh, I've actually delivered six lectures on the meaning of the rainbow yin yang uh, back in the day when I was lecturing at the Philosophical Research Society. Let me say this uh, just to give you the short answer. If I had to give you a picture of my soul, that's what it would be. It would be the rainbow yin yang. It represents perfect harmony and perfect balance and many, many more things. Uh, one day, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to transcribe those six lectures and make them into a book because, because I <laughs> could talk day and night of, about the meaning of, of the rainbow yin yang. But I, I, it is something I created and, and I think it, uh, it is the simplest, most direct, deepest expression I can share with you of who I am and uh, what my ultimate message is. Here's another. What is my view on reincarnation? I think the evidence in favor of reincarnation is very, very strong uh, to the point where I don't question it any longer, even though I came up with an alternative theory that we've talked about uh, called synchronistic archetypal resonance. At the same time, I think reincarnation is very real. What I struggle with is the issue that some people have attributed to me that I'm the reincarnation of William James, or I'm the reincarnation of the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca. I'd like to believe that that's true, but I don't because I don't have specific memories. Although for one second, for one second, I think I had a, an actual memory of having been in the palace of the Emperor Nero, who, uh, who, for whom Seneca was the tutor in ancient Rome. It lasted a split second. Um, I have endeavored under uh, hypnotic regression to recover aspects of the life of William James. Uh, nothing came through that really satisfied me, although I had to end those sessions because I began to get uh, cramps and pains in my stomach. And William James was sort of a sickly person and had th those kinds of illnesses. But so I cannot claim to have much in the way of specific past life memories myself. I used to have recurring dreams of having been killed in the Second World War, of hiding in a cellar somewhere and being discovered by, I think, a German soldier behind German lines and being machine gunned to death. And on one occasion, I asked my psychic friend Kevin Ryerson about it, and he said I was a, 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 a British Jewish soldier named Abraham Joseph Goldstein, who was parachuted behind enemy lines and, and was killed. And on one regression, 
uh, the hypnotist, a man I've interviewed, uh, Chuck Tremont, uh, said, well, look at your uniform. What does it say? And, and I looked at it, it said 303rd Airborne Division. And that was an actual airborne division. I wouldn't have known that. Uh, they may have been dropping, you know, allied soldiers behind enemy lines. I don't know. Uh, so I have really nothing that I can say in any kind of a confirmatory way regarding personal past lives, not like Norman Sheely, uh, because uh, when that interview gets released, it was just done a few days ago. It won't be released for another month. He talks with great conviction about his memories of some 30 past lives. So I... I trust Norman Shealy, uh, even though he's really a far out person. I have learned in, in the course of my parapsychological investigations to trust people whose experiences are so far out that the average person would say they are beyond belief. For me, they are not beyond belief. For me, they are uh, worthy of being taken very seriously. Uh, okay. Here's another point. Um, I ask again, somebody says, when did you realize the importance of forgiveness? That's a very deep question. When did you realize the importance of forgiveness? I I know forgiveness is very important, and I suppose it really came home to me when I worked as a seminar leader for a company called Omega Seminars, founded by John Boyle, where they emphasized uh, the idea of self-love and self esteem. See, there are two kinds of forgiveness. You can forgive other people. That's very important. And you also can forgive yourself. And in order to really love yourself, you have to be able to love yourself no matter what. Unconditional self-love means no matter what you did, no matter what you thought, no matter what you said. You still love yourself because of who you are, a pure spiritual being, ultimately. And when you can love yourself like that, then you can love other people, recognizing the pure spirit within them. And you can love them unconditionally in spite of whatever they said or whatever they did or whatever they thought. You can love yourself that way. You can love them as well. Now, Forgiveness, of course, is, is another matter when it comes to other people because you can recognize the pure spirit, but you can still be critical of their behavior. And if they're continuing that behavior, it's very hard to forgive somebody who is engaged in ongoing behavior of that sort. So let's take President Trump. For example, the man lies pr practically every day. I think even his supporters know that. And I'm not ready to forgive him uh, for that. But I have to say, I love the man. I recognize him as a reflection of myself. That at the deepest level, we are connected. We are one. People say, what about Hitler? And th that's a toughie, you know. But the same thing is true, ultimately. Even Hitler. Even, even the most supposedly evil people who have ever lived on the planet, you can be very critical of what they did. And uh, maybe it's partially because we don't understand what it was like to be them fully. And, uh, but naturally, we live in a world of duality. We make judgments. It's important to be critical. It's very important to be critical. It's also very important to recognize that no matter what behavior we're being critical of, that being, that human being is a precious human soul and, in fact, one with us. 
I interviewed Lance Mungia, uh, the person who was the producer of the uh, wonderful documentary uh, that Russell Tart made called Third Eye Spies. And Lance uh, has a uh, some videos of his own he's produced and he has a, a website and he always uh, begins his program by introducing himself and saying, I am Lance Mungia. I am another version of you. I like that. I think it's accurate in the deepest level. Here's another question. What is the biggest lesson you've learned from the years of interviewing all of these beautiful minds? Well, I, <laughs> there are many, many lessons, many, many, many lessons, but the biggest one is the one I've been emphasizing all along. It's, it's a lesson that I need to keep reminding myself about. We are all one. It's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to be seduced into thinking that we are separate, that I am my body. I'm nothing more than my body. And, and there's me, and then there's the world outside, and, and they are separate from each other. And I know even very deep spiritual traditions like Samkhya would say the same thing. They, they would say, no, you, you can't say that you're one because that would mean you're one with God. And we're not one with God, they would say. We're like the um, leaves on the tree maybe, but we're not the whole tree. Uh, anyway, those are deep philosophical questions. But for me, the deep, 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 most important lesson is, is that I <laughs> keep emphasizing is that we are all one. We are all one. We are all one. I am sitting here in my studio and surrounded by black talking to you, but I'm really talking to myself. I'm looking down at the screen. Now I'm looking up at the camera. I'm talking to myself. And, and I know there are, I don't know how many people out there. And we have separate lives. We have separate histories. It seems so seductive to think that we really are separate, that we are not one. It's so seductive. Okay. Is there any significance to the dates on which I release my videos? Now, some of you may be wondering, why did I release the video with Jason Reza Giorgiani on the breakaway civilization on April 1st? For example, did I do that deliberately? And the answer is yes and no. Um, I'm releasing the videos typically Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I don't see any special significance. I, I put them out more or less in the same order in which they were recorded. I have about a month's backlog right now. Sometimes the backlog is two months worth of interviews. Sometimes the backlog is uh, only you know, a, a week or so, or even just a couple of days. But uh, no, I, I, I guess I feel a certain pressure to put them out because I keep doing it. I keep doing it. It's been like an obsession for me for the last five years. I feel like uh, it's so important right now that we, who are all one, uh, we humans, are facing such big challenges. And it's my way of, of addressing the challenges that we face is to try and put out as much wisdom as I can and, and, and to do it as gracefully as I can, but to do it with a sense of, um, not urgency. That's not quite the word, but with a, I'm going to use the word forcefulness, a sense of forcefulness to get that material out into the world uh, as strongly as I can. So I, I just keep doing it. I just keep uh, focusing and, and, and working on it. And I am so blessed that I have a family that supports me in doing it and that I have the means to keep doing it uh, and, and to do it comfortably. 
frankly. It's as if the universe is supporting me to do it, so I do it. Uh, but no, there's no particular significance to, to the uh, day of the week or the day of the month uh, that they come out. What actually happened to Giorgiani? Why was he attacked? We're talking about Jason Reza Giorgiani, who it may well be the most popular guest on the New Thinking Aloud channel. And let me say right now, as plainly as I can, I love that man. He is one of the most brilliant people I have ever encountered, and I've encountered many brilliant people. He uh, has a good heart. He has a Promethean sensibility, and I relate to that. You know, Prometheus was the Greek titan who stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity, and he was punished by the gods because of that. He, as I recall, Prometheus was chained to a rock on Mount Atlas, and a vulture came to peck away at his liver. That was his punishment for stealing the fire of the gods and giving it to humanity. And I think maybe the best thing I can say about why was he attacked? Why has his career been destroyed? He, he's a wonderful college teacher and he loves teaching. He had a great position at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, but he was slandered maliciously and, and made to appear as if he's some kind of a genocidal Nazi. Now, one could say he had right-wing leanings, and I think people understand I don't have right-wing leanings. If anything, I consider I'm a lifelong liberal Democrat, but I love Jason Giorgiani, and I think his right-wing leanings made him very vulnerable to people who wanted to attack him and, and exaggerate uh, that and make it seem like he's some sort of a genocidal Nazi. And then people of uh, liberal sensitivity at, at that school, as many college professors are, felt that it was their responsibility to um, uh, expel, to banish, to punish anyone who, who uh, amongst their faculty who might be a genocidal Nazi. And, and it's a shame. But I'll tell you this, here's what I expect of Jason. In the movie Avatar, you know, the um, character Jake in Avatar, who uh, the great movie Avatar, uh, he becomes disgraced at one point. He, he, he is entered into the realm of, of these giant blue people, but now they don't trust him and he has to leap to a whole nother level and become, I think they call it the Turok Makto, to be able to ride that great big raptor. And, and at the end of the day, he saves the very people who had disgrace, uh, who, who had viewed him as, as a disgraced individual. I think Jason has that potential. I expect great things of that man. Next question. What is my take on the relationship between lucid dreaming and paranormal phenomena? What a great question. I think that in the future there will be, I'm going to call them psychonauts. They will be trained in the art of lucid dreaming. They will be able to go into lucid dreams pretty much every night. And when they do that, we'll see that from the realm of lucid dreaming, there are many other realms that can be explored. The realm of the afterlife, the bardo planes, the realms of uh, parallel universes uh, that Whitley Strieber talks about, uh, and the visitors, the realm of alien intelligences. All of these things, uh, we will learn to find doorways to enter into these realms. We will begin exploring these realms through the portal of lucid dreaming, much the way uh, during the 15th and 16th century, the great explorers began exploring new continents, North and South America. It'll be like that. And uh, I think probably we'll see that within the next one, 200 years. That's what I think. 
<laughs> okay, another question. Are you aware of any developments from the Skoll experiments, the Skoll group? The Skoll group um, is, uh, and the Skoll experiments refer to a, a series of studies involving trans mediums in contact with the afterlife. My understanding is that it has been researched very extensively by the Society for Psychical Research in England, uh, that there are reports out now showing that the uh, skull experiments uh, constitute excellent evidence for survival of the human soul beyond death. And <clears throat> I have to say, I think there's a great deal of evidence there, quite a lot of evidence um, and the skull experiments uh, stand um, amongst them. But I, I have nothing further to say about it at this point in time. In the future, uh, I hope to have a guest on who can really talk in detail about the uh, findings from the skull group, as, as well as certain other groups. There are, there are other groups of spiritualists who have uh, come up with some very remarkable findings, and a lot of this evidence is sort of buried in very uh, academic tomes and uh, forgotten literature, but uh, really deserves to be uh, reawakened, and, and it deserves to have a fresh new audience. So I hope to bring those kinds of findings to the New Thinking Aloud audience. Okay. What are my thoughts on UG Krishnamurti? I, I interviewed UG Krishnamurti as part of the old Thinking Aloud series, uh, some probably about 30 years ago. Now, some people confuse UG Krishnamurti, I think, with Jeddu. Krishnamurti, J. Krishnamurti, who, who became really famous uh, as the um, person whom the theosophists thought was going to be the world savior, who then turned around and rejected the theosophists. Yuji Krishnamurti, whom I interviewed, um, was a person in somewhat the same vein, because he said that he thought um, the very idea of enlightenment was basically bullshit. And uh, I remember the first time I interviewed him, we weren't really connecting. We weren't getting along. Uh, something, something seemed wrong, and he didn't want me to release it. And then he invited me to come over and have lunch with him in a tiny little apartment in Mill Valley, California. So we sat down, and he made some scrambled eggs with tofu fixed it for me, and we sat down, we had lunch together. I don't know, uh, nothing really transpired, but we had a nice time, and I, I could see he was, you know, a regular person. And then we did several more interviews, I think we were on the same wavelength together. And uh, I think of him as, uh, you know, a very fine person and, and a fine interviewee, and I liked what he had to say. I, I personally have never been a joiner. I've, I've never been, since I left the Jewish religion, uh, one to become part of a, a spiritual group of, of any kind, although I have great sympathy for all such groups. So, I think the kind of uh, skepticism that UG embodied, and at the same time, uh, as, as that skepticism, a, a deep sense of beingness, something I would call in presence, being present, being in the moment, here and now, uh, is a wonderful thing. Next question. What's been your favorite study topic? Well, isn't that obvious? <laughs> if I had to choose a single area of study, yes, it's parapsychology. But uh, to be fair, most parapsychologists don't view it the way I do. I have a very unique degree in parapsychology that many people who thought of themselves as parapsychologists wouldn't have approved of because I consider 
as part of parapsychology, the whole field of transpersonal psychology, the whole area of esoteric studies. I think that parapsychologists have to be open to the exploration of what we call psi, this magical X factor of the human mind, and how it has been woven through all societies, because I believe we are the inheritors of global human culture. And, and in that sense, I am definitely a globalist. I think that global culture now is the inheritance of everybody. Uh, so I view parapsychology in that light. It's not just uh, doing, you know, scientific experiments or reading in the journal of parapsychology or the journal of the society for psychical research, although I, uh, very fond of all that literature. It's understanding ultimately the human quest for self exploration. I mean, <laughs> new thinking allowed. You, you've got a, a, um, an archive of over a thousand videos, and I hope to produce another thousand before I'm done. So, uh, I, I guess one would have to say my interest is kind of encyclopedic in that regard. Here's another question. <clears throat> do you read most of the books you show in your videos? How many books do you read a month? No, I don't read most of the books that I show in my videos, but what I do read are, it, it, are at least one book of each interviewee. The book typically that the interview is focused on. So, uh, that's one of the uh, trademarks or hallmarks of the New Thinking Aloud series. I actually read the books of my interviewees. Uh, and sometimes I can express what they write better than they can. It happens from time to time. And most interviewers don't do that in my experience. They like you to submit in advance 10 or 20 questions that they can ask so they don't have to read the book. Um, I don't work from notes. I do read the book, but in the course of the interview, many other books are described and discussed, and uh, many of them I've read in the past, maybe in my college days. Many of them I haven't read and maybe never will read. So, uh, I would say, you know, I do three interviews a week, 12 interviews a month, so I'm reading at least 12 books a month. And of course, I have many conversations with people in, in the course of, of doing that about other books, but I have certainly had many conversations with my guests about books and about authors, uh, whom I've never really read in depth at all. Uh, and yet I, I feel fortunate that I uh, am able to have those conversations and have at least a kind of gleaning. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm no expert on William Butler Yeats, the Nobel Prize winning poet, but I knew enough about Yeats uh, from my interview with James Tunney on the Irish contributions to consciousness so that when I interviewed Whitley Strieber just yesterday, it will be released in about a month, I interviewed Whitley Strieber and I was able to draw on my conversation with James Tunney and say, you know, you remind me of William Butler Yeats. And to my surprise, Whitley Strieber then recited by heart one of Yeats's great poems and talked about its influence on him. So, I, I guess there's an example of a kind of synchronistic connection that resulted from having had these conversations, but never having read the book. I really have read very little of Yeats myself. And yet, I feel like I know Yeats at least a little bit through conversation. Okay, as long as the questions keep coming, I guess I could keep going here. Next question. Do you have an opinion of Wilhelm Reich and orgone energy? Uh, yes. In fact, I did an in-presence monologue about Wilhelm Reich and, and orgone energy. I think Reich was a very important theorist 
and uh, a contributor. His his research and his work on orgone energy is very significant and had a an instrumental role on my development as a college student. And the reason for that is in 1973, I attended the convention of the Association for Humanistic Psychology in Montreal, Canada. I took a Greyhound bus all the way from San Francisco. And on the way, I had a book that had come in to be uh, me at uh, KPFA Radio where, where I was working called Orgone Reich and Eros by uh, W. Edward Mann, who was a professor of sociology at York University. And when I arrived in Montreal, I had completed the book. I read it on the three-day bus trip. And there was Ted Mann himself. And I was able to say, hey, I've just finished your book. And he was so impressed. He said to me, well, you're a struggling college student and I'm a successful college professor. Let me help you out. And he wrote a check for me then and there for $2,000, which in those days, that was like uh, enough for me to live on for a whole year as a college student. So, uh, I owe a debt of gratitude indirectly to Wilhelm Reich and, and to W. Edward Mann, uh, a man who was very instrumental in, in my development uh, and to whom I am uh, still to this day, uh, even though he is now departed, very grateful. Okay, here's another question. How did Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and Upanishads influence you? Also, what do you think about cities which describe powers like remote viewing, etc.? Uh, first of all, let me be blunt. I have tried to study the Yoga Sutras and the Upanishads. I, I don't really relate to them very well. They're too dense for me. I don't have the patience, I think, to really study them. But I have benefited greatly from interviewing people who do have that patience. And in fact, one of my dearest and closest friends, the now departed uh, Dean Brown, H. Dean Brown, translated uh, one of the Upanishads. And i uh, very happy to have been able to interview Leanne Whitney, who uh, wrote a book about the Yoga Sutras. Uh, and of course, the Siddhis of Yoga is one of the best descriptions of the uh, extraordinary powers of the human mind. Uh, I think the Yoga Sutras is a very important text for people in parapsychology. So, I'm happy to talk about books like the Yoga Sutras that I myself have neither the patience and, and perhaps not even the intelligence to understand. That's why I think in a way, conversation is a great art form. And the ability to be able to discuss these things in a conversational setting often makes up for uh, what we're Few of us have the patience or the uh, ability to concentrate, to get through a text like the Upanishads or the Yoga Sutras that seem in some ways so alien. But to be able to have a conversation with other people who can do that is an incredible gift. I think I learned this art, actually, from one of my guests, James P. Driscoll. You see, when I was still an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin, Driscoll became my uh, college roommate uh, or housemate. We shared an apartment in a farmhouse on the outskirts of Madison. And all of a sudden, I found myself with this fellow who was majoring in Shakespearean studies. I was still an undergraduate, but he was finishing up his doctoral work in Shakespeare. And we would sit down and have conversations that lasted for three and four hours at a time. And I had never done that before in my life. 
And I discovered, you know, the joy and the beauty of an in-depth conversation. So um, I've invited Jim Driscoll a number of times back on New Thinking Aloud. He'll be back on again. But I think he's the person who introduced me to that kind of dialogue. And, and it's remained with me since then. It's become an some ways, you know, the hallmark of what New Thinking Aloud is about. It's about conversation. So, it's more about that than about the books that we discuss because in conversation, people talk about how they really feel. What does this mean to them? How do they feel about it? And I, I think that gives our listeners, our viewers, insight into the nature of the many books that we discuss, because surely if I don't read them all, I don't think the viewers are going to have any possibility of reading even a small fraction. But you can be there with me in conversation. You can be present as part of that conversation and at least get a sense of how one or two people feel about these wonderful books. Next question. Are there any new people you have found like the PK man in ability? <clears throat> and the answer uh, is, I wish I could. I would like to find people like the PK man, but he was quite extraordinary. He compared himself to Moses. He said that the aliens that uh, he thought he was working with had been searching for somebody since the days of Moses that they could work with who would exhibit the kind of powers that have been attributed to Moses. And um, Jason Giorgiani wrote about the PK man in his book, Prometheus and Atlas. And he, he highlighted that. And he said, you know, it seems as if maybe he was correct. Maybe since Moses, nobody has been able to exhibit those kinds of powers. I think probably the closest person I have ever met to that is Uri Geller. And I know some viewers think Uri Geller is a phony. I do not. Even if he uh, has been a stage magician, he knows stage magic, he probably has uh, on uh, from occasion uh, used stage magic, but many of the things he has done are well beyond stage magic. And uh, he has come the closest. And one of the wonderful things about Geller in that regard is he would get on radio and TV. And I had him on my radio show back in the 1970s talking about metal bending, talking about watches starting that hadn't worked for years. And the phone lines would lit up. Hundreds of people hearing him talk would say, yes, it's happening to me right now. This fork, this spoon, this watch, it's all happening as he was speaking. We used to call those people the mini gellers. So, I would say that's the closest uh, that I know of in my lifetime to Ted Owens, but I have every reason to think there are probably hundreds of other people out there who have, in their own way, extraordinary psychokinetic abilities. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the interviews I just conducted last week that has yet to be released is with Nancy Dutertra. Now, I've done seven interviews with her previously, but she had a miraculous healing that occurred. Uh, and uh, she talks about the miraculous healing. It's associated with a dream uh, of a uh, an alien being. It's also associated with psychokinetic abilities. And in this interview, she pulled out a huge bag of bent silverware, twisted all up and uh, uh, pointing out that she had done this in PK parties. So, there are now probably thousands of people who have participated in extraordinary metal bending through PK parties. Ted Owen's unique gift, the man I write about in The PK Man, is that he said, just as you can cause a spoon to bend, you can as easily affect large-scale phenomenon, power blackouts, earthquakes, tornadoes, and hurricanes. And he demonstrated that with about a 67% accuracy over and over and over again, producing phenomena that I wouldn't have expected more than one time in a hundred to occur by chance. Next question. 
Jeffrey, do you have any thoughts on the future of spirituality in the modern world? Well, the most recent thoughts I have stem from the interview I conducted just yesterday with Whitley Strieber, the author of Communion. And he has been endeavoring to conjure up, as he put it, through his writing, and he's written about a dozen books now about his communion, as he puts it, with alien intelligences, that he wants to see that he wants to see the human race as a whole enter into <coughs> what we'd have to call a, a, a sense of communion with the super sensible realms, with the fairy realms, with the realms of deities and devas, and even what we might sometimes call demonic entities, demonic or demonic. I mean, there's a spectrum, there's a whole range. But we live in a materialistic culture where we pretend that these are just fantasies, that they don't really exist. Whitley says, yeah, the whole spectrum is there and we've got to deal with it. And so do they. And, you know, from my encounters with Ted Owens, uh, who was really dealing with that same, with portions of that very same spectrum of hypersphere entities, uh, as he called them, the space intelligences. Yes, they are real. They exist. Or as my mentor Arthur Young said, exist may not be the right word. They ists. There's a difference between isting and existing. But in any case, the future of modern spirituality uh, will be, and I expect it'll occur, is that we as a species will come to accept that we are part of a larger community of uh, hyperspace beings with whom we interact. Just as in the 16th, 15th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century, Europeans came to realize that uh, there were indigenous populations on these new continents they were exploring, we will come to recognize that there are populations, a wide range of populations of beings in a hyperspace reality, and many of them cross over into this physical space that we're in. The evidence now on, in the field of ufology is overwhelming of, of uh, apparent vehicles uh, that have been tracked on radar that have capabilities far greater than anything uh, our military is is capable of. Well, we need to learn more about the inhabitants of, of those vehicles. And, and at some point, it's just going to be public knowledge. We're, we're going to accept that we are part of, you could call it a galactic community or a hyperspace community or a spiritual community. The irony is that um, you have to see this in, in a kind of shamanistic perspective and realize that it includes uh, humans who have departed. It includes a, a different sense of what it means to be, what it means to, to, to be a, a being. A being is not just a physical body. The being doesn't die when the body dies. Do I think that group meditation or prayer can change the state of the planet? Yes. Yes, I do. And minimally speaking, it can't hurt. I think it can have a positive effect. Do I have an opinion on Robert Monroe? I, I was fortunate to be able to interview Robert Monroe when I first began doing interviews at KPFA Radio in Berkeley, California. Uh, I hold him in very high esteem. I regard him as a sincere individual reporting about uh, his actual experiences. Um, it's also now known that he used glue sniffing <laughs> to actually trigger some of his out-of-body experiences. Um, so what? That doesn't make the experiences any less real, in my opinion. It's just an additional fact uh, about him. What are my thoughts? on the white light experience as seen in all cultures.
white light, unity, mysticism, cosmic consciousness, the awareness of everything all at once, the ability to send healing energies across time and space, the ability to feel at one with the deity, the ability to focus one's thoughts on particular solutions to particular physical problems that we need to address, the ability to reach out across time and space and remote viewing. These are all connected, and these are all very real, and these are all very, very important. If you were able to, is there a research study you would like to conduct? I'll tell you about a very significant research study. I'm well beyond trying to do research studies myself. In fact, uh, long ago, I made a decision in, in my career as a parapsychologist that research uh, wasn't uh, the most exciting aspect of the field. I, I'm more of an educator. I am more of a, uh, what I call a field researcher. I'm not an experimentalist and never have been much of an experimentalist. But, uh, Danny Caputi, uh, has been interviewed on New Thinking Aloud. Uh, she, is a, a wonderful scholar working in the field of atmospheric science, and she's come up with some interesting new experiments uh, that she is doing looking at music, music that is generated by random event generators, music that uh, if you sit and listen to music, you'll find that some music is just more inspiring. It makes you feel better. It generates positive emotions. Or Now, that's different for each person and different even in, in each culture. Musical tastes change from generation to generation. But if people are able to influence random event generators, and there's a great deal of research that suggests that this is possible, and if the random event generators are controlling the music, then people listening to that music may be able to create new forms of music and at the same time contribute to research because we can look at the statistical output of the random event generators to determine whether they are being modified uh, beyond chance expectation because uh, we have we understand the uh, statistics of, of random activity. So, I think this is a, an exciting line of research. I recently had a um, volunteer who was a professional musician, a composer, contact me uh, wanting to volunteer. Uh, we have so many wonderful volunteers. But I said to him, with your talent, you, you don't need to be translating the transcripts into, we now have translators working in a dozen different languages, or uh, promoting the videos on social media, I'd like to connect you up with Danny Caputi to see if you can work involving, uh, you know, ra music produced by uh, random event generators and uh, where that can take us. Uh, will people be able to put themselves into cosmic consciousness or higher states of consciousness? There could be a dozen different higher states or a hundred different higher states that could be uh, induced through music. And can people do that um, just by relaxing into it and um, entering into a kind of uh, communion with the random event generators? Am I planning more of these live streams? Well, we've been going for over 90 minutes, so I think this is a uh, time to uh, for me to put it this way. I've enjoyed this. This has been a new experience for me. I think I can get much better at it. Uh, I'm certainly open to considering doing more live streams. This is the very first one. I'm sure it won't be the last, but here's what I'd like to ask from our viewers. Give me some feedback about how you enjoy the live stream, what you would like to see in the live stream. Uh, you can send your feedback to friends at newthinkingaloud.com. 
I will read that feedback and, and I will, uh, incorporate that feedback into future decisions regarding live streams. So, um, I think we've been going for a long time. I haven't checked on the, uh, channel. I, yes, I see it, it's still active. In fact, I see we have 473 concurrent, uh, viewers. Uh, but I, <laughs> I think for now, uh, given my energy level, uh, 90 minutes is about right. I, uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, close the live stream at this point. I want to thank you all for your questions uh, and for your positive energy. It's been a delightful experience, and uh, it's being recorded. I will release the live stream. In fact, uh, what I'm going to do is include some of the photos that I had planned to release uh, when I talked about my early life and my family and some of my other experiences uh, I'll release the live stream. I'll do a little post production on it. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for uh, being with me. And uh, let me just check one more time if there are any final comments. Uh, I want to thank our moderators, Laura Newbert, Jim Hosier, Emmy Vadness, Dan O'Farrell have all helped by moderating the live stream. Uh, we've had, uh, we've been blessed now by over 200 volunteers who are working with the new Thinking Aloud channel, uh, including people like Barbara Burton, who proposed that we do the live stream. Uh, I want to encourage, uh, some of you who may be uh, still viewing right now. If you're not a volunteer, you might consider joining our volunteer group, and you can do that by sending a, an email to friends at newthinkingaloud.com. Uh, we do send out a newsletter now, goes out every week to the volunteers and to the donors of New Thinking Aloud. I, uh, really don't like doing a hard sell with regard to donating, but it helps us keep going. So you can donate by logging into the New Thinking Aloud Foundation. That's newthinkingaloud.org. So, uh, with all of that in mind, let me extend my deepest gratitude to those of you who have been with me throughout this live stream. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you.